Are you trying to establish your brand as a thought leader? Start a podcast, invite industry experts to be guests on your show, and watch your brand become the prime resource for decision makers in your industry. Learn more at sweetfishmedia.com. You're listening to B2B Growth, a daily podcast for B2B leaders. We've interviewed names you've probably heard before, like Gary Vaynerchuk and Simon Sinek, but you've probably never heard from the majority of our guests. That's because the bulk of our interviews aren't with professional speakers and authors. Most of our guests are in the trenches leading sales and marketing teams. They're implementing strategy. They're experimenting with tactics. They're building the fastest growing B2B companies in the world. My name is James Carberry. I'm the founder of Sweetfish Media, a podcast agency for B2B brands, and I'm also one of the co-hosts of this show. When we're not interviewing sales and marketing leaders, you'll hear stories from behind the scenes of our own business. We'll share the ups and downs of our journey as we attempt to take over the world. Just kidding. Well, maybe. Let's get into the show. Welcome back to B2B Growth. I am your host for today's episode, Nikki Ivey with Sweetfish Media. Guys, I've got with me today Jeff Bibby, who is Chief Marketing Officer at VIX. Jeff, how are you doing today? I'm doing awesome, Nikki. Thanks a lot for having me. Hey, thanks for coming and talking to me today. I'm super excited to get into this topic. Uh, I love talking about the value of brands, and you're going to tell us a little bit about uh, your experience with brand revolution and what you've termed the house of brand approach. But before we get into all of that, Jeff, I'd love it if you would just give us all a little bit of background on yourself and what you and the folks at Dix are up to these days. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks again. I um, So Jeff Bibby, I'm Chief Marketing Officer at Dix. We are very focused on, on one specific area, which is an area not many people really uh, interact with too much, but it's cloud email security. Uh, it's a very important area, and thankfully, it's happening behind the scenes for most people. And so, I am uh, pumped to be able to talk to you today about the challenges we face of bringing together many of the different brands that uh, we've acquired over the last three years. I love that. I love when I get to talk to the the practitioners, the folks doing the work that sort of makes all of our cyber worlds go around <laughs> without us uh, without us knowing about it and just sort of shine a light on the, the work that's happening behind the scenes on that. And so to jump right in, a lot of the work that's happening or that has been happening over the past uh, little while for you guys has been this brand revolution. Give us an overview of what happens in a brand's journey or lifetime that puts them in a position where it's time to start having conversations about the evolution or revolution of that brand? Sure. Yeah. I'm really fortunate in my role that I've, I work for a CEO that really understands the importance of brand. And so what happened for us was, and this gentleman's name is Dave Wagner. He's our leader. Dave joined us in January, 2016, and he asked us to um, evolve the brand at that time. So in Q4 of 16, then we launched it in Q1 of 17, we modernized the look and feel of just Zix. And so we went out, did a very exhaustive process as we did both the quantitative study of a thousand different potential buyers, as well as a lot of anecdotal interviews with customers and partners. And one of the things that they said loud and clear was they looked at us as the gold standard for uh, being able to deliver encrypted email and email security. And so that really, really hit home with us. And so we introduced a new color to our color palette, modernized the logo. Then we announced we're a public company. And so we told the street that we're going to continue to, to grow through acquisition. And so over the last three years, we have done five acquisitions. So we've been really busy. And so as part of that, we're trying to find a way to be able to bring the power of the acquired brands together in a unified story and a unified visual look and feel that looks coherent to the, to the street and helps respect the brand equity that was already built. And so that's what we've been focused on. Right. And that's how you came up with, you just end up deciding on this house of brands approach, which we'll dig into here in a, in a second. but. We talked a bit offline and you, you talked about how when, when a company comes to this point, right, they've got a few choices, right? You could do nothing or you can do the, on the other end of the spectrum, the really aggressive thing and change everything. Talk a little bit about what those choices look like for you guys. 
Absolutely. So it didn't feel right to do nothing. It, you know, that would be just the ultimate and conservative. And it would really result in a bit of chaos because you can just imagine where you'd have two teams telling two different stories and confusing the market. And the whole reason that we brought the two companies together, and I'm referring to the most recent acquisition being the largest one of us bringing together Zix and App River. Each brand was about 20 years old, and so a lot of people knew both brands. And so we don't want to have that state where we just ignore and run as two separate entities. We didn't want to also go to one new brand, which is a pretty aggressive approach, because we do intend to do more acquisitions. And so we wouldn't be really future-proofing our brand strategy very well. We'd be right back at the drawing board again with um, you know whatever newly acquired company we have in the future. And so that led us to the best of both worlds, which was a house of brands approach. The house of brands approach gives us the opportunity to have one unified story, but also gives us the opportunity to add other brands in the future as we go. And so for us, it was clearly the best option. Yeah. Yeah. I, as you talk about it, it sounds like it'd probably be the best option for anybody going through those things, unless you had something like some really serious brand fatigue or some negative things associated with the older brand. But I, I, I like the way that you, that you laid that out, but it, it does still seem like a challenge as far as how do you then come up with what the unified story will be? Because in, in redefining the brand, as you spoke about offline with me, when you love what you do and you work with an organization that you believe in and, and when you've been there for a while, it starts to become who you are and you do internalize uh, what's associated with that with that brand. And so if each of the folks from these acquired entities has that same feeling for their brand, how do you go about coming up with a unified story that sort of respects all of those? Yeah, absolutely. So it is a big deal and we've enjoyed the benefit of having an employee base on both sides and of their long tenured. I mean, they've stayed and just love the work environment that they've been in. And so it's a really woven in fabric of who they are. And so, so we involved them. We did a lot of, a lot of um, upfront conversations, interview as part of the research and interview phase and, um, and involved the, you know, all different levels of the employee base customers and partners to arrive at, at this approach. We then looked at uh, both brands through the lens of a Myers-Briggs personality filter. So looking at what is, what is the actual brand personality. And then we looked at the same, did the same sort of thing and looked at it through the lens of what is our person, what is the brand archetype? People in our industry loved actually use the hero archetype. And so I'm going to supply you with security. I'm the hero, and I'm going to use a tactic that's likely going to try and scare you. People aren't scared anymore. You know, the security market has done itself a major disservice by trying to uh, beat that message into the buyer's mind. People don't buy it anymore. They want to understand how you can help them. And so what we did that's different is when we brought the two companies together, we're actually the, the ultimate personality for us is the guardian caregiver. And that, the, an example of guardian caregiver brands, there's Allstate, there's Volvo. And so we are fiercely, fiercely protective of, for example, our partners and how we can help them grow. We're fiercely protective of our customers and how we can um, help be supportive and, um, and strong for them. And so, so that's ultimately what came out of this process in terms of our archetype. I love this. I love this. What you mentioned, I like how the, the, the brands you mentioned that, that have this as their personality type, this uh, caregiver, Mm -hmm. protective caregiver, those are consumer B2C brands. And as much as I think B2B brands can learn from and take from and apply from what's already working over there, the better. And this is just a really good example, I think, of where where that, that works. Because you're right, in the discipline that you guys work in, in the industry that you guys work in, there is, there's a lot of like, you know, teaching folks to be afraid of the, the creepy hacker and is your stuff secure type situation that's sort of played out at this point. Right. And so it's it's just a really smart way of of differentiating yourself 
at the same time as you guys are, yeah, of course, at the same time as you guys are still navigating all this, these other things that come along with uh, growth by acquisition and, 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 you know, getting the most out of brand equity and that it's just a, it's a success story. So uh, thank you for laying that out for us. I'll ask you real quick to give any parting wisdom before we move on to the next segment, folks who find themselves in this situation and, and navigating uh, these types of decisions on maybe where to begin, where to focus their energy first, or just how to get through it all? Sure, yeah. So I can't emphasize enough um, the need to reach for an agency in this case. So we, we reached for an agency. They did an excellent job for us. Their name is Studio Science. And they walked us through their process, which was research. Then we get into the strategy, uh, which I just talked about. We then moved into what everybody finds is the really exciting phase, which is, you know, then you get into the brand level messaging and, and then and finally, a really exciting phase, which is when you're testing your level of conservativeness or progressiveness on the brand visuals. Mm. And so, so that's always a really fun part. But messaging, one, there's one step that I think people can often miss or just um, you know, breeze past, which I can't emphasize enough. And that is we took the time to test our messages, of which there were six potential messages. And we tested that in a quant study of a thousand buyers. And the reason that gives you so, the reason it's an important step is when you get feedback from a thousand potential buyers and they very universally support, you know, your top three messages, it gives you an incredible level of confidence as you bring those messages to your sales teams, to your partners, to your employees. And so for us, that was a really key piece of the process. I love it. That's so important. Confidence, anything that you can do to, to, you mentioned give confidence, particularly with your, with your sales team between sales and marketing teams in particular, uh, things that engender trust in the data, confidence in the data to to where that message isn't something that salespeople individually are having to think or God forbid, second guess because they've been, they've, they've seen it proved out. I think that's really important. Thank you so much for, for coming and, and sharing uh, your experience with us and laying out how you guys have been able to successfully navigate this. So now, Jeff, that I have successfully picked your brain and seen what I could get out of it, it is time for you to tell us about what you're putting in it. So tell us about a learning resource that you've engaged with that is, you know, informing your approach that's just got you excited these days. You know, I am in a very privileged position to enjoy the benefit of being the number two uh, cloud service provider for Microsoft. And, you know, they, they are a brand that's been around for a long time that people don't necessarily look to, but I am, I have been absolutely blown away by the way they live their values. And so I just this week was in Vegas at their, one of their major conferences. They are operationalizing a value that I hold near and dear, which is empathy and talking about how they can uh, turn empathy into something that is incredibly powerful as a way to, you know, have success at scale. And uh, if you haven't seen what they're doing in that regard, I highly suggest you you check it out. They have a very unique model for being able to bring empathy to bear, which first starts with proximity and getting to know a situation, then moves into a few other steps. But for me, as, as crazy as it may sound, because you don't necessarily have to... Um, to a brand that's been around for that long as, um, you know, as really being that pioneering, it is, and they're doing an absolutely incredible job. So getting a lot of motivation from them. I love it. I love it. Empathy at scale, because a lot of the time, the the empathy conversation, uh, at least for, I have a sales background, right? I've spent some time in these startup streets as a salesperson. And the empathy conversation is, you know, we're talking about individual, I don't know, personality traits or individual skill set development. But like you're talking about understanding it from an organizational or even brand perspective to execute empathy at scale. That's really interesting. Uh, so thanks mm-hmm. for, for sharing that with us. Um, and so I know, I know, Jeff, that like me, everybody listening has become a fast fan of yours and they're going to want to know how to keep up with you. So tell us, tell us how folks can connect with you. Absolutely. So my go-to is LinkedIn. I am much more LinkedIn guy than a Twitter person. And so, uh, I I would love to connect with anybody, and uh, that's the best way to reach me. I love it. I'm a LinkedIn girl myself. I probably spend too much time on there, but I'm not sorry. Uh, So, guys, if you're looking for them on LinkedIn, it's Jeff, uh, G-E-O-F-F, Bibby, B-I-B-B-Y. Do it. Um, it, You're going to stand to learn from someone who's, like I said, successfully navigated this brand stuff in the way that he just laid out for us. Jeff, 
I have plenty more questions for you. So the only solution is I'm going to have to have you on again sometime. Uh, but in, uh, until then, until then, thank you so much for being on. And uh, best of luck to you guys in continuing to innovate and contribute yourselves. Thank you, Nikki. This has been great. We totally get it. We publish a ton of content on this podcast, and it can be a lot to keep up with. That's why we've started the B2B Growth Big Three, a no-fluff email that boils down our three biggest takeaways from an entire week of episodes. Sign up today at sweetfishmedia.com slash big three. That's sweetfishmedia.com slash big three.